scooty scoot gooch. Just make sure we have audio. It says we're live. But are could we? it be true? Could we be live? Are there going to be people here? Could we be live? Oh, I think good. We are. Half the battle is the fact that the sound works. <laughs> goals. Goals, goals, goals. Goals are to stay on topic. Uh, yeah, right. Okay. It so happen. we should probably start with the pizza stuff because we will. Oh, you want to start with pizza stuff? Sure. I mean, I'm all for starting with pizza. Hello, all of nobody. Oh, 15 no. of you. No, there's 15. Just there's, there's nobody, right. uh, nobody uh, typing. It's there's all. nobody typing yet. So all let's right. talk pizza prices. Let's talk about pizza. Are you trying to sell them pepperonis and cheese? Or are you trying to sell them the whole pizza? <laughs> so it's a great question. Me and Marvin have been uh, redoing some of our pricing. And yeah, we also, because a lot of people, this is where a lot of IT companies get stuck, especially when you talk about like the MSP pricing. Now, the MSP pricing, the concept is if you're going to be a managed service uh, provider, you're going to give them a complete package, a whole pizza, maybe even a delivered pizza, mm. as opposed to selling them all the pieces and tools uh, ad hoc and going, okay, you know, you want to just buy a bag of pepperonis and some cheese, but another guy's going to bring you the dough. And obviously, mm. then you got to coordinate because you got to make sure the right amount of dough. And then you got to talk to whoever's going to cook this thing and they got to make sure they cook at the right time. And that's kind of the difference when you try to sell. What's instead of a bunch of pieces and components, you want to sell a business outcome. You want to sell things totally. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's that's a very different concept. We've been making sure we've been trying always to be what else can we include. And I actually had a meeting with another IT company. Uh, the owner's a really nice guy. And we're very like minded on a lot of things. And uh, we talked, we just discussed this as he's gotten, he's, uh, his company's a little bigger than ours. And he's just really gotten away from providing uh, anything but a managed thing because of the busy work. And we were laughing about this because we had a client by no fault of ours decided not to renew their domain. Uh, they just <laughs> didn't think it was relevant. And uh, now they're mad because their domain's gone, their email is gone and they got to get it all back. And it's just like, you know, you offer to manage it and it's, I kind of get because there's so many different components in it where you kind of have to be holistic occasionally because by nothing we did, they screwed it up. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. You, you could have paid us and we would have taken care of it. But Calamari and prawns on a pizza, though. Blech. Oh, that sounds me. good. Oh, no. I would eat that. At all. Are you a there's, pineapple pizza guy? No, there is nothing about that pizza that makes me want to eat it. I am a seafood Muscles, lover. Calamari and No, there's nothing <laughs> about that I want to eat. Yeah. Mm -mm. Domain should be auto renewed, no exception. We're going to go a step further. Because of the, the number of scammers, we've had now several mm. domains taken because they signed up with those BS domain companies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, your, your domain is about to expire. You need to renew right now. And yeah. It just happens to transfer to mm. us. And yeah, and they just transfer it over and then lose their domain because they transferred it mm -hmm. over. So it's been such a disaster dealing with these things. I uh, They're just such a mess. They're not anything that... Uh, but how do you price managed services? Well, and that's actually the real subjective thing. And me and uh, because this guy happens to be not too far, he's about an hour away from us. Uh, we met halfway in between. Um, that's our pricing is very similar because we cover similar service area demographics. But pricing is not something that you can say uh, what exactly what it should be. And let me tell you why. I, I was told by when we do some work with a guy in California, like, how do you survive on those prices? But when you talk about a small 800 square foot house costing $1.2 million, mm. you talk about you have to make $150,000, $200,000 a year just to survive. Mm -hmm. so everything is scaled uh, because of that, like the building. Um, here's an example if you want to understand our demographics better of what it is to work right here in the southeast area of Michigan. We have a 2,000 square foot building. And I mean, granted, we got a good deal because we did some remodeling, but we're paying like $1,000 a month for the building. I, if I go to Oakland County, my friend has a smaller building that he pays four times as much. Mm -hmm. That's the nature of it. So the pricing has to kind of be right with it because it scales across the board. Everything here is cheaper where we are. It is less money to live. Therefore, you hard to demand the higher prices because the people don't have it because they're not running businesses that are of the size. You go downtown. 
uh, you go like to someplace like New York and work in a financial district, your MSP price better be well over a hundred something dollars a seat um, oh, or even $200 a seat because yeah. of the expense of being in New York city. Mm -hmm. Same thing with California. So your pricings are going to be very much all over the place. And it's funny because um, the uh, pricing is so driven by the market that you're in. So there is, if you're in those different markets, you're going to have varied prices. So the pricing itself, what we will be talking about probably in a future video, though, is some of the packaging and how we put it together. Um, and it's not hard to reverse engineer the packaging to figure out what the pricing should be based on your demographics. Because the pricing is what it is. The reality is Microsoft uh, Office 365 hosting or G Suite hosting costs the same across the board, which is very interesting because in our area, they think it's expensive. It's not really that expensive in any other area where the demographic is higher. So yeah. Uh, real quick, someone said, what do, you, what do I think about squid caching? Uh, I think it's an awful idea, and I did a video of why it's an awful idea. So uh, <laughs> reach, re read through my videos and look for PF Send Squid, and you'll find out what my thoughts are in a longer video of all the reasons why, which I won't list here. I'll just say I did a video on that because so many people have emailed me and questioned me. So now I reply with the video. This is why it's a it's bad idea. idea. <laughs> it's a great idea. It's easy to have. That's why, that's why you have the videos. We have a client that's very happy with a video that we made for them that like they keep getting, you know, they're, they're a, a construction company. And so they, they get people all the time that are like, can you recommend a roof like on the uh, Facebook groups and stuff? And so now they just send them that video that we made yes. them. Making video responses are awesome. They're just like, and that's part go. of the LTS creative where we're doing the creative marketing stuff. So we're definitely uh, expanding into that business. And once again, we're actually able to offer it somewhat cheaper uh, because of the demographics, we, you know, it, I don't have to pay $200,000 a year just to make ends meet here to each staff member like they do in California. Yeah. So, um, it, you, you can overall things go a little down. So pricing is very subjective, but the packages, uh, they make sense no matter where you're at. So it's just a matter of what you need to charge for them because what you're factoring in for the package pricing, uh, is your cost of living allowance, you know, the, the big variable parts, your payroll and what your building costs are going to be your two big variables. The reality is we all know what we pay for G Suite, the RMM tools. Uh, we're under NDA not to talk about the pricing of the actual what we pay with each contract. But the reality is uh, if you've been around the block and you've jumped uh, and switched between different the major RMM platforms, they're all within a few dollars of each mm -hmm. other. They're really not substantially different. Um, same with the backup programs. They're not substantially different in prices. So, yeah. So it, it comes down to, again, <laughs> selling a solution, not selling. Yeah. Not selling the parts of it. It's not selling the parts. You want to hand. You want to when you're. You want to hand your client the solution to what they need. So the packages we're looking at. I mean, yeah, you've got your 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 RMM and your backup. Your your whatever your productivity suite is, and then like we're even looking at like phone. Like basically is like here's your tech package, and we will manage everything for you. Yep. Um, right down to renewing subscriptions when they need to be done and all that. So then they don't have to worry about it. it's one bill they pay every month. They're not worried about, did I pay this one? Did I pay that one? There's six bills coming in. They pay one to us and we take care of it. And uh, based off hours, not really. Um, we kind of do a hybrid approach. And I've talked about this before and we'll get it more concise because we're you know making it more concise. Uh, but it's a hybrid approach where we don't charge for like the nickel and dime phone calls as part of the agreement with them. What we do charge for is projects. So it's not that we allot a certain amount of hours to them. We will maintain all these things for this price, but when you need other things, you will pay us for that other thing. Like you, you know, you're switching ERP systems or whatever uh, implementation you're doing. That's a separate billable action. That is not the same as your daily maintenance. So by doing it separate like that, because that's the wild card uh, that's really hard. If you do the full seat, as they call it, where we take care of it no matter what you have, the problem you run into is if they decide to get innovative and change products a lot, you have a lot of billable time with that client mm -hmm. um, versus that you have to eat because you're just trying to get them on a monthly charge. So coming up with a hybrid approach, I think works a little bit better. So by yeah. project, not by hour. Yeah. Uh, always charge by the project, not by the hour. And let me just in general, this is why, and this is also sometimes I have problems when I give prices to people uh, who email back and forth and just want me hourly. I'm going to quote you a crazy high hourly price most of the time, because if you just say, I just want you per hour to do all these random tasks. And I want to watch you do it. No problem. My time is worth a lot. But let me explain something. How long does it take you to set up, a, let's say, PF Sense, popular product? How long does it take you to set up the VPN? Why does it take you an hour? And why does it take me only a few minutes? And why should I be able to charge $100 or whatever to set it up? Well, that's really simple. 
you know how many I've set up and how much time I've invested to get so good <laughs> that I've done it. Mm -hmm. You actually, if you try to build by the hour, the better you become at it, the less money you would make at it. Doesn't that seem kind of backwards? Yeah. So if you spend all my time to get really, really talented at a skill, then I should do it. I, I would make less money if I charged by the hour. And why, why invest time in? I should do it as slow as possible <laughs> if I'm doing it that way. Don't retain any information. Have to look it up every time. You know, I look at some of the people I know that my, are my Linux engineering friends who are very high level building servers. Uh, they are wicked fast at it. They have a series of scripts. They know how to set up and secure. They do not spend any time reading through the manuals. They have spent years honing their skills. So they give you a flat price to achieve the goal. And it's always better to start with what's the goal because sometimes people ask me the weirdest things that they want done. But I'm like, this is not an intuitive way to set it up. Maybe five years ago, 10 years ago, this was the way you would have set this server up. So that's also why I always sometimes start with what's the goal uh, because you have this really weird request. And uh, that's, that's actually a really good point. I think you should, whenever doing a project, you should always start with what is the ultimate goal. Yeah. Because Some people are like, I just want a, a proxy server here and a proxy server here. I don't want a load balance between here. I'm like, that's not the efficient way to do it. Let's mm -hmm. start with what would, what is it that you're trying to achieve first? Then we can work it the other way yes. because there's probably even a better tool that I'm aware of. And that's something um, my friend, he spends a lot of time on engineering things that were created <laughs> just, and they spent a lot of time because someone told him it was a good idea to create this way and he's like that was best practice around 2008 yeah 10 years later there is a singular tool that will automatically do all of that and make it easier and more redundant so that's that's kind of yeah always start with the goal and that's mm -hmm. that's part of it now i also put in microsoft got git and uh <laughs> I'm going to do some follow-up videos on this because right? I've been waiting for the dust to settle because I will admit people are losing their mind over it. I, I always laugh. Now, there's a couple problems here. Now, first, I have some somewhat insight, uh, insight, not inside, insight oh. into maybe some insight. Maybe. I know people. <laughs> yes. Anyways, uh, but been, I, I never would say any of the inside information because you can't cite the sources and I would never want anyone to defer anything I learned from people that I know, whatever. Uh, not that there's any inside information on this, but that being said, we did happen to interview the people who brought Git to Microsoft. Uh, that was last year, so that's kind of an interesting, um, whole uh, story of how Git came into Microsoft. Now, GitHub, if you're not familiar, it's a code hosting company. Now, Git has lost GitHub has lost money for a number of years, they're a startup that got funding and their burn rate, which means more money goes out than comes in. That's not a good thing. That only lasts as long as you have venture capitalists to fling mm -hmm. money at you. At some point in time, the venture capitalists will go, you know, I'd love to get my money back. <laughs> Let's have a fire sale. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's happened with many companies. So Microsoft's purchasing them uh, is possibly saving them from a being purchased by other companies and b it's possibly saving them from just disappearing altogether uh now the more ambitious project if you're into open source is creating uh gitlab repositories and if you uh, gitlab has a self-hosted system and there's been an ambitious idea to create where everyone hosts it so you have a distributed file system with a common federated system uh so you have that consolidated field so you can find code repositories but the code repositories are linked together. That's a cool future I think we should work towards. The short term is I got a lot of links to GitHub and uh, I don't want to break. <laughs> so yeah. neither do a lot of my friends that publish their code on GitHub. So I don't necessarily think it's like Microsoft's evil and it's just to destroy them. It's a thing. Uh, Microsoft has realized that they're a shift and their company is moving towards making a lot more. Um... So since we just talked about goals, what do you think is Microsoft's goal Yes. In purchasing GitHub. Right. And their goal. What is it? No. Oh, oh, really simple. Microsoft makes their money hosting the servers mm -hmm. on Azure. It is their full all in on it. Now they will continue to make money for their products as long as there is. But let's let's run some numbers for you real quick here. Any new developers that are starting out, how many of them are developing apps that run on the desktop, a new app coming on the desktop for Windows? Yeah. Like I'm gonna probably say that number's still sitting at zero. Um, <laughs> here's here's a here's a number for you. You're giving me nothing to work with What's, so far. I know. How, how, and let's look at the let's look at the app market. 
Uh, let's just talk about one single app because I have kids that like this stupid app and you have an iPhone. Uh, we'll, we're going to narrow it down to the Apple iPhone market. Okay. Only iPhone. And we're going to take the top game on iPhone, just the game, mm -hmm. which is going to be Fortnite. Yeah. What is the dollars per day you think Fortnite brings in? It's a free game that has upgrade sales for skins and BS. Oh, God. What's that number? Oh. A day. A, a day? Yeah. Uh, several thousands of dollars. Yeah, 1.9 million. Million? Yeah. Uh, so, as an app developer, holy, you know, a young geez. app developer, where am I going to go? Is there any chance I will make $1.9 million a day off of a desktop app that only runs in Windows 10? So, all right. Now that we've covered the why they like Azure, and <laughs> the only thing running on desktop apps anymore is legacy support things and Photoshop. So, legacy apps are existing. <laughs> And Photoshop because we need to make the thumbnails. And you're so you're just seeing this in major things. So uh, priority is Azure for them. That is what they're moving towards. I was there. I spent a lot of time at the Microsoft headquarters. I spent time interviewing people. You go over my podcast and look through that. And when I wasn't doing the interviews, which is only some part of what I was there, I was doing nothing but hanging out with the C-level executive people, talking to them and learning about their stuff off microphone and things that weren't released. So, you know, because we have to be private about that stuff until we had dates we could release even what we did interview them for. It, they're all in on the Azure thing. I got to meet the core developer teams. I sat twice with Corey Sanders, had a great conversation on look up who the guy is. He's awesome. And they never and, told you we're going to buy GitHub. I know they what didn't. The? Just, I know. I know. So the whole thing, uh, GitLab does not run on Azure for those of you that say that, uh, GitLab runs on Google and they have their own server farms. So by the way, for, I keep saying you do it, but yeah, anyways, that's uh they they moved there's if you if you google gitlab on google uh you'll find that they moved off of azure they did used to run on azure so you're not wrong i see that in the comments here so um someone said my payroll software company there's a reason years ago <laughs> i switched to developing only everything in web apps hey look i'm wearing invoice ninja and there are we have millions of dollars in invoice ninja that we imported it's all a web app it's scalable it's easy i just invoice something from a client as soon as i was done uh -huh. you know what i didn't do open up some stupid desktop application because <laughs> you know right that doesn't it's uh -huh. freaking 2018 why would you do that so Terrible yeah terrible. so no they are not still on azure i i am not going to bother sending you the link right now i will i will i tweeted the link the other day so they are not on azure so <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, there are those people. Uh, quick, quick. Oh, what am I drinking? I am drinking uh, Adawala almond milk. So uh, I, for those of you that don't know, I, I joke around about eating healthy foods. I actually eat a lot of healthy foods. I've accidentally created at least one more hippie um, on the other roll here. I've got Kyle eating goji berries and kombucha mm -hmm. and eating fermented foods like I do. So. Mm -hmm. And it, I'm actually, I joke around. Um, my friend used to say, I hate hipsters, but I like everything hipsters bring because I sure. like coffee houses and things like that. Yeah. My friend used to say, yeah. I, I really am indifferent to hipsters. I'm, I'm with um, it. But it was always funny because I'm like, I am not a hippie. I am not someone who's like, oh, I only eat, uh, you know, plant, blah, blah, blah. I happen to like the hippie food, though. <laughs> sure, <laughs> yeah. Some of it's hippie very food good. all day. You ferment some stuff, I'm happy. Some of it smells like <laughs> hot garbage, though. That does happen. Like the day um, I rolled in last week, and it smelled and like hot garbage in here. Marin, you are convoluting the hosting of the website versus the hosting of the application. The website is hosted on Azure. So I guess if we're going to split hairs, I'll, mm. I'll give you that one. The website's hosted, but the actual uh, code base and the server farms are not. So there you go. <laughs> gotcha. gotcha. Nailed it. Yeah. I details are important so i guess yeah. i guess we have to say what we're host so if you mean hosting the website versus hosting the code all right there we go we're both right there <laughs> moving on to vpn thing. filter because i did the thing about that and i want to follow up just quickly about it and uh doo -doo -doo. yeah i know there's a twitter chat do you, whatever uh i you can prove it by signing into gitlab and looking at the ip address of the sign and not the website anyways uh <laughs> the or just host your own code. I don't know why this is relevant. Let's move on to VPN filter. Because <laughs> there has to be an absolute right and an absolute wrong. Because it's the internet. Yep. Uh, the 
the next thing, VPN filters. So uh, I see all these people worried about the FBI doing it. I do have my own reservations about the fact that the FBI took down the domain that was a command and control center. Uh, and, and for those of you that maybe didn't watch the VPN filter video, what, what VPN filter is, is the name given by telesecurity researchers to the uh, malware uh, botnet. It's about 500,000 strong. Now, the update they had yesterday was quite an eye opener of uh, the long, long list of firewalls that are affected by this and devices and someone pointed out there's some unified devices on there which is also kind of weird because they're not they're not unified routers they're unified site to site units that shouldn't mm. be public facing on the internet but in the realm of people that plug things in it is it's just like when you scan printers i mean i remember we looked at one point and there's 78,000 open printer ports for hp printers that's also something that should not be public facing on the internet but you know it is so <laughs> it's, I got nothing. Wow. Um, I know 78,000 of them we looked when we were looking at Shodan. So there are a lot of things in there. Now, someone said, you got to tell people how they got infected. Well, it's pretty easy. Uh, every way. And it, that's the problem. Default passwords, public facing things that should never be public facing um, because their land side was public, uh, somehow accessible from the internet. So they use a, all the exploits. Then so far, they have not identified any of them that were done from a new exploit. There are no one, no zero days. They're just using things like default username and passwords, default open ports, and unpatched router versions. Because all these they are finding are running on old versions of software. So yeah, it's just a major mess right now of all of this. The majority of it's consumer equipment. The, the one that's not, and apparently this was fixed in 2017. I don't know which firmware version. You can look it up. The Microtik, Mic Merotik, Microtik. I was saying it wrong in the last video, so I'm going to carry on and say it wrong again in this video. <laughs> but you, those of you that use that product know, and you've asked me to review the product before, and I just have not had the interest one of the time. Um, apparently their previous versions were vulnerable. And of course, they've been around a little while and every product they have runs the same version of the software. So therefore, all the ones ever deployed that never got updated since then, and they've been around for a number of years. So these old ones are floating around and they all got infected. So they're all now trash in the internet with 500,000 botnet strong. So <laughs> these attacks only scale up right now. What really the updated one was micro tick. Okay, someone actually, yeah, there we go. So have you an email client reboot the routers? No, if they're my client, they do not have one of the routers on the list. That's, <laughs> that's the answer. Um, we are pursuing, of course, some of the clients that we do know have the router. And I call loosely call them clients. They're going to be completely unmanaged clients and suggesting replacements for all these things. So micro tick. How are you sound? So that being said, yeah, uh, the unified equipment affected, like I said, is a site to site unit. Now their site to site units happen to have, if you watch one of my reviews, routing ability. Uh, they can act as a basic NAT router. I don't know why you would use them that way. Maybe there's some edge use case. We always use them in a bridging mode and we set up the management network separate than the network layer that they're transporting. So it's done securely. So even if they, even if someone happens to be on the network that it's bridging, you set them to be on a separate management network. So it's not, they're not generally, if they're properly configured, not vulnerable. What happens most of the time is people leave the default username and password and then they get infected because they're on a network like that. So I don't know that there's a specific flaw in the unified site to sites. Now there was, if you're wondering, there was a CVE vulnerability in some of the previous unified site to sites, but the CVE vulnerability was technically a lower score one. The reason why is because it, it was a crossing over. You had to have a non-admin user created and log in, then you could cross over to be an admin. Why would you on a site to site create a lesser privileged user? <laughs> and then let that password be out there. It's kind of an edge case. We only create one admin and we delete the default. We create an admin one um, and secure them. So we don't ever worry about that as an issue. So <laughs> yeah, that's the, there's all kinds of weird little things like that. So uh, I, I know the WIS use them, but even when the WIS use them, they generally are gonna set up a separate management network. And this is actually even how your Comcast cable modem works. There's a separate management network that is transparent to you. So you have the ability to transport layer over the public IP space. They don't use the public IP space to attach to your router. They use a management IP on the system that is hidden to their network. This is how most networks are properly managed. There's a separate, even though it's on the WAN side from, for all intents and purposes, it's a separate management network. So that being said, it's different. So you wanna make sure it's set up properly. And so 
hopefully, and don't get me wrong, I'm willing to bet there's a wisp out there that has this completely <laughs> misconfigured. Because, <laughs> man, I, uh, <laughs> on a fun note, and my friend had commented on this, because uh, he was part of the people that did this. Um, this was fun. Uh, speaking of botnets, this botnet was attacking, right? And it mm. hit a honeypot. And the honeypot whacked back. Now, this is kind of funny. So just typical things. So if you set up a honeypot, and I mean do some honeypot videos because you're fun to play with. Uh, the honeypots listen for people to try to hack them. The hack came in and they said, hey, let's look at who's hacking us. Holy crap. They have all their ports open. That's weird. <laughs> um, I wonder if they left the passwords at default. Well, look at this. Look at that. Would you know that? So they pwned the honeypots. The, the honeypot. I mean, they pwned, they pwned the botnet. And they ended right. up taking control of a large botnet. They're like, so it took some time here to build a botnet, but left it at the default. And by the way, if you don't know, there's some botnet frameworks that are literally for sale on the dark web. That's where these come from. And that the credentials were still, yeah, there's default credentials for botnets. Botnets as a service is a thing. So, oh, <laughs> And they said, thank you. They just arrested that one guy. In the, he's involved in some of the Yahoo hacking stuff, but mm -hmm. the, which was funny because the defense was the best defense ever. It was almost as good as Kwame's defense we had here. The, 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 Your Honor. He hacked so many different things for so many different people. He had no idea who he was hacking for at any given time. <laughs> and <laughs> that was the defense. Yeah. And if you don't know what the Kwame defense was, this is this is my favorite part of when our mayor went to jail of Detroit. <laughs> if you didn't follow that case like we did, mm -hmm. it's the 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 argument was Kwame couldn't pay back the money because Kwame has to keep the appearance of a lifestyle of wealth. Yes. Oh, so course. he cannot take the money that he has and give it mm -mm. to pay restitution. No. Because so, that would deprive him of his ability to present wealth. And he has to present wealth to look for a new job because he got just. Well, except he's in jail. <laughs> now, oh, by the way, the defense didn't work. Yeah, well, imagine that. Imagine that. Because if I was like, I don't know, I've broken into so many houses. I don't know if I broke into that one or not. <laughs> Oh um, someone said the Comcast public static IP seem to hate PFSense. I've never experienced that. Uh, not an issue for us. Matter of fact, PFSense and Comcast, that is, Comcast is the dominant uh, in our area here for uh, internet providers, for business. PFSense all over the place with them. We never have a problem at all. So really, I, I, it is one of those things. I see, I've see. i seen also some people keep complaining about PPOE and PFSense. I I don't have any advice for you on that because I keep having people who keep complaining about it. I've seen complaining about it on the forums. Here's the problem. PPOE is not that popular, uh, not like it used to be. So you are, have become an edge case and there's not enough data because I can't, I couldn't even demo a PPOE system because I got none in here. They, we, those went the way of the dodo here. Uh, so there's not much I can do to test it. I don't have any PPO links. I'd have to build a PPOE server. And if I took the time to learn how to build a PPO server, I'd probably build it right. And then it would work with BFSense, and I wouldn't be able to solve your problem. Right. You're dealing with a PPO compatibility with whatever ISP who probably has it set up wrong. <laughs> so it may not be BFSense at all, but this provider is just dumb yeah. because, well, that happens. Much more likely <laughs> scenario, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I actually have to go. Okay. Because it's five, and I have somewhere to be. He's got somewhere to be. Are you going to stick around? I'll stick around for a few right. minutes. Tom's going to stick around for a bit. So. Yep. Yep. So keep I keep him busy, everybody. Keep me busy. It's not like he has anything to do. Nope. Nope. <laughs> I'm supposed to send a lot of emails. <laughs> I do have that much to do. I will say because maybe they're watching, and I will not say any names. I will just say I haven't received that email with the NDA. And if you are among uh, those people that are, should should have sent me an email with an NDA, so we may continue on a venture. Uh, please send the email with the NDA. <laughs> I like being vague when I have 115 <laughs> listeners. <laughs> and that's all we have to say about that. That's all we have to say about the threats under <laughs> NDA. Just, we just <laughs> want to tell you to send the thing that we promise to not tell anybody about. Yep. There's that. <laughs> yes. Uh, loving Pop OS. So that is... Uh... <laughs> yeah, it was sent to the email NDA. All right. I will look for the NDA. I will look for it. There's no problem there. That being said, I'm a. Which way did I need to scoot? You? I want to be more in the middle now. I feel I feel centered. I just want to find your center. <laughs> find my center. In love with your cheese. Uh, love and Pop OS. Uh, ooh, you know, I forgot we left this on the table. These things are still great. And if you're wondering, these are not. This is the uh, Edge Router X. They are still not on that list of uh, things that VPN filters having a problem with right now. So, the um. 
Edge Rider Strong Pad. The only problem you're going to run into with some of these is uh, not being super, super fast. And this is this is becoming a common question is, I have gigabit internet. I want a cheap router. The other thing I've mentioned, I mentioned this before in my last video, is you want a cheap router. Cool. But um, the problem is the cheap routers are often the now the ones that cause this problem. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Magnus. Oh, I'm uh, torn... Thank you. I'll just say thank you because I, I cannot say your name. Sorry. <laughs> I can barely say English words. I don't even speak another language. I'm just not good at that. So, <laughs> yeah, but I, this is even what I run at my house. But then again, at my house, I don't have a gigabit connection. I think I have a 60 meg connection at my house or something. So I, it, it, I don't really need the fastest internet at home. We just watch Netflix and play video games. And it, this actually works really good for video games, by the way. I have no problems at all. Um, I, you know, I don't play a lot of games. I should say my kids have no problems playing video games on it. It definitely works for there. Uh, a cheap VLAN search that cheap and work well is going to be the review I did on this uh, TP link. Uh, I, I still would recommend this. If you're looking for something that's inexpensive, that works well, pretty well and has an amazingly shiny box we've uh added this to something we think is a good buy for the price i think it was like 40 bucks or something uh eight ports gigabit and 40 dollars. you pay like 25 bucks just for any gigabit eight port router 15 more dollars you get vlans and the other fancy features i covered that this has i got a video review on it so um yeah i'm not 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 really complaining about it at all uh, yeah, the Miro tick, I, I got nothing against them. Uh, obviously there is a, uh, flaw. So, uh, in the old software, but the good news is Miro tick as a company is releasing updates. Uh, my understanding from reading in the forums when it comes to a lot of the consumer, you know, the D links and net gears and links, this ones out there, a big majority of them are end of life. They don't have a long life cycle support anyways. And uh, there's been a lot of times where even when they say they release an update for the firmware, the firmware doesn't fix the flaw in them anyways. Uh, in one of them, I don't remember which model it was, well, the con I mean, a couple of consumer ones had a flaw where no matter what you did externally, UPnP, and it makes no sense why, externally was available. Even with the firmware update that was supposed to fix it, it was still turned on with no way to turn off. So there's a few of them that there's, and the, you gotta remember, the consumer stuff is a race to the bottom. Security's hard. You're trying to take, and you don't even see this in the enterprise. You're trying to take all the features. You're trying to take Wi-Fi, routing, and firewall functions, and then build it into a consumer device for $49.99 and put it on the shelf of a big box store. Uh, you end up with a device that they're not gonna spend a ton of money on engineering teams to program them well. So yeah. Can confirm the launch system site seems to be down. Really? That's interesting. I'm actually going to check to see if my website's down. So LawrenceSystems.com. That would be fascinating if it's down. Maybe I'm getting DDoSed. I don't know. You guys broke my website. <laughs> it, I will can confirm my website's down. I don't know the why. I just know the that. Oh, I can tell you that it's a server problem. So it's actually working. It's just going at an incredibly slow pace right now. So such is that. <laughs> we want the pizza price. Uh, that's part of the problem. Yeah, 99 cent drink. Can't go wrong. I am a uh, very frugal person and I am as frugal provided it does not interfere with things because I value my time. So I can be frugal as long as this also has to be time efficient. I obsessively think about these things all the time. Uh, one of the things is I watch people who wait for the right gas station and drive around too far. For like, I'm like, you are crazy to do that. So that is, yeah, not you got to you got to like don't drive out of your way to save a dollar because then you wasted a bunch of time and gas trying to save that. I don't know. I can go on a rant about that, but I won't. But uh, I do. As long as it's within my path, I will grab things that are at discount. And I'm like, oh, then it happens to be that these were on sale for 99 cents. And I bought all of them and stuck them in the fridge because they don't expire for a week. And now I have one of these each day for a week. <laughs> um, no, it wasn't a free PBX issue. It was a ring central issue. 
So Ring Central people, after I left the Ring Central network, I ported over our number and anyone on Ring Central could not call. Now, this is where it gets really aggravating. I did a five, once I was done and it took almost three weeks to get this fixed with Ring Central, they kept promising me to fix it, promised me to fix it, and wouldn't fix it. And someone says, Well, you have to call as your customer. Yeah, we did. That because they certainly didn't want to talk to us. So we had to uh, get credentials from our clients and pretend to be our clients and answer the security questions as if we were calling from someone else and they would work on it. But they'd say, well, that number moved from us. It's porting. It takes time, blah, blah, blah. They were just less than helpful. So we kept, I kept publicly shaming them on Twitter and bumping up the retweets. And, uh, you know, I, I, the only thing I can do is publicly shame you on Twitter because you didn't really want to resolve my problem. And you were very, very unhelpful until I kept pushing the issue on Twitter because calling and talking to people got me nowhere. Matter of fact, I, they deleted it, but I shared the screenshot with them of the email they sent me that they said, we can't help you because you moved away from us. And I'm like, I know, I don't want to go back to you either now. And uh, we've, we've changed our tune. I even told them, you know what, this is the way you're going to behave. Then I'm going to remove my uh, Ring Central video and we'll make it a priority to switch all of our clients to talk them into something else. So, yeah. So it is super problems. Cheap Sierra Cable for a Sierra uh, console server. Uh, I don't. I don't know. I never use, I have not needed to use a serial console cable in forever. If I used one, it would be probably at some client for some specialized device, but it's been a number of years. I know they make some USB ones that I've seen in the past. Everything we do anymore really doesn't require serial console cables. Kind of sort of an exception is going to be like your SG3100 boxes have that, but you don't need a serial console cable. You use USB and a driver uh, to do it. So yeah, they're, yeah, but yeah. T uh, someone has also said the TP link switch. I like them. That definitely, yeah, definitely really good here. Um, yeah, public shaming is the only way to go with companies. I agree. Fun note: some people were complaining. Somewhat, I don't know. They were complaining about the ads uh, on YouTube the other day. I seen different YouTubers complain about this, and the ads were for. Uh, against the things that they were for in the videos. Someone's like, hey, YouTube, why are you running ads that are against my whatever I'm talking about? But I actually look at it differently, maybe, and maybe because it's less controversial of a topic. But uh, I've been told by a few people who sent me screenshots that said, uh, did you know Ring Central is running ads on all your free PBX stuff? I'm like, <laughs> yes, I'm getting paid from Ring Central. Thank you. Anyone who runs the ad, I technically get a piece of the revenue on there. So, therefore, now I'm making money off Ring Central, who, while people are watching, why they should be switching to free PBX. And there's something about that that I love. <laughs> so, I I don't know. Um, yeah, the Cisco cables, I assumed they would. They look like they're the same pinout. They're like the RJ45 to serial. Um, those I've seen a lot of. So, maybe the... Maybe the old Cisco ones. I tell you what, there are boxes everywhere on eBay of those uh, old Cisco cables, the Cisco serial console cables. Because uh, that's back years ago in the old days. I mean, we used to have to do serial programming for all the switches and things like that. And I used to, let's go back a step further. In late 90s, I started uh, learning phone systems by programming Meridian uh, Nortel equipment. Um, then I got out of it because it was just a headache. Uh, it wasn't really my specialty, but I used to use a serial cable to uh, fix all that stuff. So yeah, that's it's been a while. Uh, what else did you guys want to know? I plan on doing some videos of my XCPNG lab pretty soon. Uh, it's really the same as the one I had with before using uh, the Citrix Sense server. Everything's on XCPNG now. I just moved it all over. Uh, so that's that's actually working uh, really, really well. I haven't had any problems. And one of the nice things about the XCP AG migration was it was smooth. Like I in place upgraded over the top of Citrix and they've done some things since then. They've uh, enabled the yum. So I can now just yum, update it and patch it. Uh, it's so it's really smooth. It's a nicer transition. It just works really, really well. So I like that. Um, other things is a wireless site audit. That's a little bit tricky. Uh, we're, we did, get, we actually, and it's funny, we were late because I just got approved. Oh, okay. <laughs> Our website's back up. I just got a message from my guys. It's It was some type of whatever the server pausing problem was. Apparently, it's now resolved itself. Hey, look, everything's back up and running, I guess. Yep, my website's back. Problems temporary. Maybe it was all of you at the same time hitting my website. <laughs> uh, 
Lots of question here. Um, I did a whole video on it. We switched, so just a just short of it, but there's more in depth on the video. I have two of them. Uh, one is our setup, uh, just in general, and one's the real in depth setup with Chris uh, from Crosstalks, who actually got contract to do this. The uh, we went with Vitality for the phone service, and we went with um, Free PBX Sangoma, their latest uh, spin of it. Uh, so we did that distro and I, like I said, I have all the details in those videos so that, and like I said, it's been working fine. And then my other video, a shorter one, if you just want like the summary video, uh, talks about like that we use Zoiper and things like that to make the phones work. And that's, like I said, that's been working perfectly fine. I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, what else was I going to say? Do, 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 do. What else did you guys want to know? So let's see. The only thing I don't like about XPNG is uh, that XO isn't for hardware pass through. Yes, if you're interested in a hardware pass-through, it's really not. Uh... Yeah, oh, there is a uh, XCP center, too. There is their XCP and G has a Zen Center software uh, as well. I'm, I got a video, and maybe if I have time, I'll do it tomorrow. I've just been really busy with a lot of projects we've got. But they do have the Zen Center. They have their XO. They also have their XO Community Edition. It has all the features. But if you're looking for uh, hardware pass-through functionality, that's it's not really designed for that because you don't run into that in the enterprise market most of the time. And I'm going to, you know, defer you to like level one tax. Uh, Wendell has a few great videos on what they're working. On. I think it, it's the KVM stuff where they're doing full GPU pass through. So you can play games inside of uh, uh, games inside of Linux that run on windows by doing a whole pass through with the VMs. I don't just don't do that. I have a separate Windows gaming box that mostly my kids use, and I don't really play many video games, so I I lack the use case for it. I have just, all my clients that are running that, it, they're not asking for you know like we built this big setup for a client uh, with all XCPNG, and all they want is redundancy in VMs. They don't care about pass through. It runs a whole bunch of small uh, servers to make their company work. They, their GPU pass through the less business use case for it. It's kind of niche. Uh, mostly for the gamers. And I yes, I do have clients running VMware as well. Uh, so, well, I'm not as um, we, oh, the Windows infrastructure. Most of my clients run window uh, Windows infrastructure. Some use Hyper V. Uh, Windows is the majority of our client base. I, the reason I don't, and I've had people ask me this more than once, why don't you talk much about it? You know how boring it is to me to show you how to set up a Windows Server 2016 with RDP. Next, yes, next, yes, type in license, type in license. Buy licenses, by the way, which if you didn't see the pricing on 2016 server licenses for RDKs, they're expensive. I actually have someone I'm actively consulting with setting this up for another IT company um, who wasn't sure how to work it. It's easy. It's I, I find it easy. I find it boring. I find it expensive. Uh, it's not interesting either. At least I, I have no passion for it other than to do it. And I don't do as much of it anyways. I do some of it. My staff does most of that because that's like our day-to-day -day work. Our day-to-day -day work is fixing Windows all day, fixing Windows servers all day, solving stupid DNS server problems, Active Directory problems, weird things we run into. That is our day-to-day -day job here. Uh, I just really like Linux and tinkering with all this and sharing enthusiasm for tech. So that's why the channel is more on that. Um, yeah, Proxmox has some pass-through options as well. I've never, like I said, I have no use case for this, so I'm not, it, I just don't have enough interest in doing it. Uh, most times for, hey, look, we got our game to work. I'm like, cool, what game? I don't play any games really. So it becomes very difficult for me to uh, drag my interest in there. The other stuff that I, um, the other things that I'm very interested in that I may or may not do some videos on, I have a handful of friends that work on, uh, work in hacking and pen testing. Uh, I do a series of <clears throat> pen testing stuff that I do internally to our products and do testing for stuff when we want to test networks. I may get into doing some videos about that. I'm always worried about it um, because if YouTube perceives that you're doing something that they think is wrong, they will not let it get posted on a channel and I could run the risk of losing the channel. I don't remember if Chris uh, has publicly shared the story, but Chris has mentioned his channel got uh, a strike against it for, you know, uh, something really simple. It's just one of those silliness things that happen. And he, absolutely non-malicious, but you get caught up in the stupid algorithm. So I'm a worried if I did hacking stuff, I, it would have to be on a separate channel, I think. That way I don't have to worry about as much of it because YouTube is a platform is picky and I don't want to screw this channel up because I did some hacking videos. And YouTube goes, you know, those could be perceived as blah, blah, blah. And then, yeah. So 
that's why I don't, I do a lot of that. That's my other hobby stuff I do that I use my lab for is testing that out. If, and that's why if you've ever seen, I, I'm quick to pull up Wireshark and a series of other tools when I want to do some analysis and things like that. Uh, but pen testing, I don't know. I've seen a couple of channels. I know Live Overflow has a wonderful channel on doing some of the pen testing and doing some of the capture to flags. Uh, that's a lot of fun to do those. So yeah, Open Vast is really nice. Um, that's, you know, th there's a lot of cool tools out there. And if you haven't tried it, um, Parrot Security, that distro is a very complete set of tools for you to start playing with. So if you're like, what are some fun tools to test with? Parrot Security. Now, just to let you know, if you haven't worked in that industry, if you are into that, you will find that the professionals do not bring a copy of Parrot Security when they go to do pen tests. They do a real specific narrow target attack. The downside of something like Parrot Security or Kali Linux, which is um, also very popular, is they're very noisy tools. So it'd be kind of like just dragging a, a whole brass band in through the front door. Like that tool, there's a lot of things going on and you'd start setting off alarms if there's any type of monitoring and further it has like out of the box, a lot of things very pre-configured all rolled in so you can start just playing around with stuff. And uh, it's... Things on there too, and like I said, I'm I'm on the edge of it. Of maybe I'll do more videos because I see the demand for them, and I've got a background in some of that as well. So uh, maybe I'll be adding more of those to the channel. One of my big problems is um, time. It's all about time. It's having enough time to do all these things. I have delegated my business. I've talked about this. Like Marvin does a lot of the admin work in the business, things I don't want to deal with going to the bank and cash and checks and uh, functional business things. I do more technical things, but I'm still an employee of the business doing that. And YouTube actually pays me about that much money, even with all the affiliate links and everything else. So it's, yeah, that's the whole thing. I need to, as someone said, throw money at me. I'm working on it because we're being very, very careful. I have a few meetings lined up. There's also reasons why I brought up the NDA things. I also have a few other things. We're lo looking for some channel sponsors, but I'm very careful about who I will let sponsor. Uh, one of the things I'm working on is going to be like the Linux Foundation. Uh, they're a very reputable company. If you haven't heard of the Linux Foundation, good people. <laughs> so uh, we may be working out a sponsorship with them. So we're going to, you may hear some uh, mentions of that. So that's, there's the, as I do that, that'll have me uh, freed up more because as more income comes in, I can then hire another person to do and delegate more things to because I really like doing the YouTube thing. Uh, so that's a lot there. Uh, someone says, oh, do you still recommend iDrive? Yeah, we actually have an affiliate link for iDrive. I might do a video on it. iDrive is one of those things that for a lot of the, we know a lot of, uh, they're technically a business. One man show work out of their house and they don't want to use OneDrive or they don't use G Suite. They just want something that backs up all their stuff. We've recommended iDrive to a lot of people. It's inexpensive. It's simple. It's kind of a nice, complete, inexpensive solution. And we also let them know you set it up, you babysit it, turn the little notifications for email and uh, have at it. iDrive's not a bad product. They've been around for a while. So, how about using it for Windows servers? Yes, uh, the cheap companies are, they love using it. If you're looking for an inexpensive solution for Windows servers, I drive. I actually think it works quite well. Um, it's not near as robust as a SolarWinds product that we usually use, which is a full stack. I mean, it creates complete images of the machine that I can restore. And I can even go back like a few weeks and restore a snapshot of a machine with SolarWinds. That's outstanding and great. I drive is like, yeah, it backed up. <laughs> and it kept a copy on site, kept a off site. It actually has plugins for uh, a few different things. So it's, it works good. Um, Oh, net data. Net data is definitely great. So Open Drive, I was looking at your affiliate links and thought I'd ask. I haven't tried Open Drive. Uh, Backblaze. Backblaze, I don't remember. I think I have a link for Backblaze too. I've done one video on Backblaze. I plan to do more. Um, I've done a little bit of playing with their buckets because uh, we thought about setting some things up in there. We're gonna. I need a place to store all my videos. So uh, I may set up a Backblaze bucket just to store all my videos, but I want to, I've been working on, and I've, here's the problem. Do you trust the cloud? Most people can say yes, but should I encrypt it before I put the cloud? I've been working on some scripts that will encrypt before I send. Right now, and maybe I'll just do this video first. You can set up a bucket in uh, Backblaze, tie it to your free NAS, and it will automatically sync your free NAS to the bucket. Unencrypted, but it does it. Now the buckets are encrypted, and it's as much as you trust Backblaze, whether or not they're secure. I think they're a reputable company. Um, their reputation means they're not likely someone's going to break into your bucket. 
whatever. Yeah, and it's just my videos. So if someone stole my videos, I, I actually want them to watch all my videos. So I'm not as worried about that. So I probably will uh, both set that up and do a video on how to set that up just so you uh, have it. Duplicati to Backblaze. There's actually... Now, here's something a little bit cooler, and you can encrypt with it. And I've done a review of the CloudBerry software. If CloudBerry is really cool. They have, they're one of the few companies that sell a uh, multi-platform backup software that supports, I think, at, at least 36 different backend storages. And it actually supports more because if you are a storage provider and you made an S3 compatible uh, storage it supports S3 compatible. So, so technically they support all kinds of different storage. And so if you buy a license for the uh, Cloudberry Labs, one of the choices is Backblaze. So you can encrypt beforehand, store it in Backblaze and use Cloudberry to facilitate the backups. And uh, Cloudberry is just, it's a really great tool. I've demoed it. We've done bare metal restores with their professional editions. Um, it's a cool product, and they do have, if you're interested in MSP dashboard on their uh, system now, that you can sign up for like a two-week trial for free. It works really, really well. I've been really happy with it. Uh, backup rsync.net support ZFS. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, that there are ZFS snapshotting elsewhere. There's also tar snap, uh, so that's one of them too, but... Backblaze, because of the way they run the company, read about them and the way they built the company, they have really inexpensive backups. Backblaze is really cheap. So definitely uh, hats off to them for being able to do what they do at, at scale and actually make it pretty affordable. So um, Synology C2 for their NAS machines. Uh, I Like I said, I have not tested Synology or any of the other NAS ones out there. I've always just gone with free NAS. And I'm not someone who likes to stick with just one product, but I love open source products. I like the non-lock-in. I like uh, the, the liberation of my data. And the free NAS people have always been really, really good because of that. Because a lot of people say, well, what about this software? And I can't remember the other one. Unraid is the other one a lot of people ask. I don't think there's anything wrong with Unraid, uh, but I'm very big on products being open source. And we have uh, we work with the TrueNAS people, which is why I reviewed some of the TrueNAS servers. We're trying to get our hands on a few more of them for reviews, some of their new product line. Uh, they are great. They're solid. They're just, they make such a great uh, product. I, I, the other ones may be excellent. Um, we have a handful of clients with, uh, what are those, Netgear Ready NASes? They had them when we got there. And I'm not someone when we move into a client that we go, all right, we're ripping everything out and replacing it with exactly the things I want, uh, we work around there. We even have, I, someone asked me if, what I thought about the Zywall or Zixels. I think there's Zixel Zywall. I can't remember the name of the company. I have one client that uses them, works fine. Um, they're not a managed client, but they, the product has never had a problem and the, this works really well. We're not ripping it out. It supports their VPN. They're a cloud provider because they're, they're an office, they're a serverless office. They just are workstations that use a Zixel to connect to their cloud provider over private VPN uh, for a private cloud uh, SQL program that they purchased. It works great. They don't have any problems with it. And the company recommends that particular firewall because uh, they know it really well. So that's like their cookie cutter thing for these little four person offices that uh, use their product. So, yeah, uh, IX Systems, overall, my experience of just working with their engineers, they're knowledgeable, their support is on the spot, they're easy to talk to. It, everything about the company, um, so from an experience standpoint, both their product is really nice, their hardware choices are really nice for the way they build them, and the overall experience of dealing with them on a support uh, has been excellent. So there's nothing top to bottom that I've had a problem with, uh, and the free NAS as a product is just you know, outstanding. Granted, I will admit uh, the free NAS interface one day, maybe they'll, they'll update it is a little bit goofy because some of the menus go this way and some of the menus go this way. And I've talked about that, but I've done a series of tutorials to kind of demystify things like how the jails run and things like that. So uh, jails permissions, by the way, though, the jails are more of a free NAS thing. Once you get into the enterprise, uh, the enterprise storage means the enterprise box runs just the enterprise stuff. There's no jails on the true NAS. That's one of the things that they don't really, you don't really want a bunch of things running on your NAS when you're in an enterprise environment. You break everything out into its own focus and purpose task. But when you're running at home, you're going, hey, I kind of want my Plex to run on my free NAS so I don't have to have two computers running in my closet so I can watch movies. 
that's why it makes sense in the free NAS world to have the jails and things like that. So they, they it is a good product. So uh, testing Aero admin. So do you have a clients that have successfully run soft phones over Unify Wi-Fi? I'm running a soft phone over Unify Wi-Fi every single day. And so is my staff. Uh, works fine. I'm using Zoiper. Uh, I've had no problems. Oh, and by the way, I've tested on the newer Unifies, but we have one of the original Unifies from 2013. The it's, it's still updated and it works absolutely fine. I've had no issues. Most of the issues, um, uh, yeah, yeah, we use, we have Yaylink too. The, the, uh, most of the issues come in at the firewall level with the QoS. You gotta have the QoS set up right. I don't care if you have the best, uh, wireless if your qos is wrong at the firewall you're going to get all kinds of problems so that is a uh, definitely a big issue so but uh the a link phones uh, chris did a review of them his review spot on i commented on them that we've used them for a little over a year and they work wonderful because we had them even when we had ring central we were using the a link phones still using them now wonderful phones no issues work great love them uh they nothing really complain about for them so, and the same thing with Zoiper, really happy. That's uh, the, <clears throat> there. Oh, having trouble using FaceTime ever since I was in it. So I'm going to assume you're an iPhone user. If you're an iPhone user, there is a checkbox for the low power setting on some of the Unifies. That being said, you may want to turn it off because there apparently the spec, and this varies from model to model. We ran into this. There's, I forget where the checkbox is. Uh, but search like iPhone low power Unify. And it's not just Unify, it's a lot of different models of wi of newer Wi-Fi access points that have trouble with iPhones because they, the iPhone apparently did not follow the spec or came up with their own low power. And it causes a low transfer speed or higher latencies with that. So that's, uh, if you're wondering, <laughs> uh, that's there. Uh, how to set up a video on how to set up QS properly for VoIP um, maybe it's next. Yes. Yes. Next, next, yes. Next apply. Uh, that's if you have PF sense, there's <laughs> really, uh, I'll, I, maybe I'll do a video. It's not going to be really long. Um, if you wanted to tweak the hell out of the QoS and do something completely weird with it, sure. Uh, maybe I'll do a video on that, but I will tell you, Mark, I have Mark Furman for no, he did a great video on it. Uh, he did a lot of time to explain the depths of QoS. And then at the end, he does the same thing that I can tell you. Uh, the default settings in PF Sense are well thought out and will make the QoS work perfectly fine. Uh, so that's that's one of the nice things to know. So it's it's not that hard to set up, and that's one of the reasons. Years ago, that's one of the earliest things I used PF Sense for was uh, QoS shaping because um, we came in to solve problems for people where they said, "I can't get my phones to work because we got VoIP," and uh, especially when you're dealing with lower bandwidth. Uh, you need to make sure the bandwidth is well allocated towards things like, you know, VoIP. So the, it it's always been a good tool for that. And they've only improved it. And because if you wanted to do QoS by hand and learn how all of it works and how the whole system works and what all the different algorithms are to apply to traffic shaping, um, it's very complex. That's why the people at PFSense took best practice and integrated into a wizard that does next and yes and next and yes. <laughs> so they knew it's a common thing and they built in a, a little couple pull downs and put the VoIP in and away you go. So, uh, yeah, I may do a video on it, but it's not, it, it wouldn't, it doesn't need to be in depth. That's the favorite part. So, uh, the QS is definitely works really well. Anyways, um, I think I'm probably gonna have to wrap it up here in another 10 minutes or so. Cause I do have somewhere to be at a roughly six o'clock. Uh, for those of you that don't know, if you want to know what some of my hobbies are, uh, I do get offline uh, completely when I go offline. I uh, am going to get on my 1971 Honda scooter and hang out with a group called the Scooter Geeks. And we all like old scooters or some of us like new scooters and uh, we like old motorcycles and things like that. So it's kind of funny that, you know, uh, my excitement was uh, tuning the points in it because I just had to fix the points on them. And if you're not familiar with points are, look at them. It's, it's the before electronic, before digital electronic ignitions, you had a point system. And that is actually um, something that I have on mine. So I, I've, I grew up if, uh, my background is actually when I was a kid, I grew up on a farm and used to fix really old 
1940s and 50s tractors uh, with my grandfather. That was, <laughs> I came from a very different place than where I am today. I've always been a very technical geek. I've always been very mechanically inclined. I've built uh, race cars and everything else. And yeah, uh, a little Honda electric scooter. I've debated about that, about the electric scooters. I have a thing for these really old, the, the simplicity of the mechanical of it. Um, the, it's if you don't know what a Honda CT90, and for those of you that are Aussie, you're going to call them a uh, posty bike. Uh, if you want to look up posty bikes, you'll get an idea. They have them here in America. They were called posty bikes in Australia because they were used by the Postal Service. Here, not so much. They're just called the Honda CT90s, uh, but they're really cool, man. They're just, uh, yeah, it's fun. I've, I've hell, I used to build race cars and things like that. I've always had a lot of those, and I finally got out of the race cars. I got out of some of the motorcycles, and I just goof around with some scooters sometimes. Well, those little offline hobbies. <laughs> so, yeah. So when I'm not playing with firewall rules, I'm sometimes adjusting points on a on a 45 year old Honda. <laughs> Hoder Moto Campo. Yeah, those old Hondas are fun. I don't know, just little things. Uh, oddly enough, on my personal channel that's just called Tom Lawrence, there is a, there's a video of one of the Hondas, and I think it's got like 10,000 views because I reviewed my Honda because <laughs> I'm weird like that. You know, I am I get excited about those little things. Yeah, flexing. Now, that's something else. Uh, so board level work is also something I, you know, I thought about doing, I love Lewis Rossman's channel. He he's very good at the, I don't watch the channel that much. So I can't say I really love his channel, but I like what he does where he really gets in depth on board level soldering stuff. And uh, that's actually me. I used to own a TV store. I owned a TV VCR repair store back in 2004 and I closed it in 2009. I say closed, but that's not exactly the right way to put it. I stopped doing it and it was never a separate business. I owned my computer store that started also in 2004, uh, the Lawrence Technologies. And then I had these, uh, another company and it was all in the same building. I just quit doing the TV repair once it became not profitable. But yeah, I was a TV repair, uh, sit down with solder gun. We actually uh, look up. Uh, we did a lot of, I get this one got me into high end audio. We fixed two amps. We fixed like the old Morant stuff and we did, um, what else did we do? Just all kinds of any kind of electronic repair. That was a big part of what we did back then. I have always been a geek with a soldering gun. So that's always been, you know, it's the, the computers have been in my blood for a long time uh, and you know, Highly technical things have always been what I like to do. That's always when I have a little fun there. <laughs> yeah, uh, Rossman, he just kind of goes on about stuff. I've, I've not always listened to, he's been, he's very interesting, very insightful. I listen to a handful of his videos. Uh, and the reason I always am hesitant before I say I love his channel is I mean, I don't watch it all the time. And people sometimes go crazy. And so I didn't know where he's at in life, so to speak. Like, did he go crazy? Did he not? He seems like a pretty down to earth guy. Uh, pretty, you know, pretty cool. But his, uh, he seems like a really smart engineer. Any of his engineering type videos where he covers stuff that I have watched is great. I'm also not the biggest consumer. I watch YouTube, but I don't watch a ton of TV at all. Um, I probably watch maybe half an hour a day or less of YouTube. Uh, cumulatively, because I'll go a couple days without watching it, and then I'll watch like two or three hours of it in one night. That's about it. Uh, that's yeah. I don't be because of that. I'm limited. Like I watch the AVE uh, blog, the the guy who talks about how it chooches from Canada. Love that guy. Um, so I, I put on a lot of his stuff. But so much of my time I spend tinkering with Linux firewalls, experiment with ideas. You guys don't even know how many videos I've recorded that never got uploaded because they weren't as perfect as like if I think I got something really, really wrong on a more tutorial, I'll just start over again. That's a lot of my hobby is just trying ideas, seeing if I can make something work. I've done in-depth setups on things. And if they don't work the way I want, I don't make the video on it. So uh but I do know how to set up a lot of different things. You know, I've set up a series of different servers for this and that. Um, and like I said, maybe I'll do more uh, Linux videos. That's part of my thing. If we do work out the sponsorship like the Linux Foundation, I might bring someone else on if they're interested that wants to help me make more Linux videos. Uh, we'll see. It's kind of pie in the sky stuff, but yeah. Um, we'll love to know about the USG Edge Router PF Sense for SMB as well. I mean, I've done them. The thing is... So Unify, and I always said this, they're very good quality-wise, very basic function-wise for a firewall. So if the client doesn't need VPN or anything, great. 
if they need VPN, I go right to PFSense. PFSense has always been my uh, go-to for just the advanced features. You, you get very familiar with the product, and uh, we keep just working with it because it works so well. Um, for hardware for your new Zen server, yeah, I it's the same Dell R720, so it's not anything too new and exciting. Uh, it's still the same one that we unboxed and talked about in a video. So you can watch my uh, lab tutorial. All you have to do is replace the words Citrix Zen Server with XCPG Zen Server. That's it. It's the same. Uh, the links are going to be different. And I'm going to do a follow-up video, like I said, just so I have one video to reference. Like, here's the lab video with XCPNG on uh, there. Even though the USG does VPN, it doesn't do OpenVPN as smooth and as nice as I like it. Uh the way PFSS deploys is so automated. I just think it's great. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, Row control software, team viewer alternative, self host. Yes, we are using, it's now called ConnectWise Control. It's originally called Screen Connect. If you look through my channel and you look for Screen Connect, you'll find I've, I think I've reviewed it twice at different versions. I may do a review of the latest version because they added some more features. It's really slick, uh, self hosted. It's not, um, it's not cheap. But it's really good. And uh, so here's the thing. Solar Winds offers us the MSP Anywhere platform uh, for free. Comes with our Solar Winds package uh, inclusively. We use it and have it installed. But for the most part, especially for any ad hoc work, where when people contract me to do mint uh, work, we use the, the uh, ConnectWise control software. It's great. It's uh, just the way it works, all the little features and bells and whistles. And when you self-host it, um, you put it in the cloud or put it in your own data center, wherever you want to put it uh, and set it all up. You get to do your own branding on it. And you have unlimited sessions uh, that you can keep connected. So unlimited unattended sessions, but then you buy a license for how many concurrent users at once. And concurrent users is how many texts can be using it at once. So, you know, we can have X number of texts simultaneously logged in, but we have like 500 computers connected to it. We just can't be administering any more than uh, at that, that license number at any time. Buy NetGate. No, that wouldn't be awful. Uh, I've not tried that many other ones. Part of the thing is there's so many of them out there um, that I'm like, yeah, that's, um, I, we've, we've just settled on the one we have. Not to mention, if, if we do switch, we have 500 systems we have to go and change the software on. So uh, that's not arbitrary. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. Uh, the other thing is I'm a big fan because a lot of people ask me about a lot of different VPNs. Look, OpenVPN figured it out. They've gone through their open source. Big plus there. Works on Linux. Works on my phone. My phone connects uh, through OpenVPN to our office to make Zoiper work so I can make phone calls out of the office when I'm not in the office. That works fine. OpenVPN is just well documented. It does NAT traversal and networking very, very well. And uh, it's been code reviewed twice by two separate independent code reviews. That being said, they found small minor tweaks in it that they fixed. So it's very, very secure. So it's solid, it's secure. And I'm going, I've been working on a video. Uh, we, let's just say one of my friends who does security is overseas and he is, we've been working on ways to bypass solidly VPNs and some auto scripts for this. Now, if you want a little hint for this, Look back at our last Sunday Morning Linux Review podcast about Streisand VPN. I'm working on a series of videos about Streisand. We've been doing some testing with it while my friend's been overseas, and it's been pretty cool. And uh, we're definitely going to do some videos because a lot of people have asked me about how to get VPNs because they're in a country that restricts uh, things a lot. Well, there's a workaround for it, and I'm, I'm going to work up an entire like start-to-finish tutorial. Now, I've done the auto-deploy VPN uh, for how to set up OpenVPN. The problem with it is uh, if you're using any type of deep packet inspection, OpenVPN will get caught up in deep packet inspection because they can identify the traffic pattern as OpenVPN and many uh, places will block it. So that's where you have to go a step further and you have to do HTTPS encapsulation. So that's where it that gets a lot harder. A few people ask me about setting it up. It's not natively supported in PFSense. Not the ideal way to do it in PSS, but there are ways to do it. And uh, it's just, it's an in-depth. It's not something I, I, I see any future in PFSS supporting because they don't have a really use case for it either. It's not a commercial uh, request. Matter of fact, they, they're the opposite. They generally in commercial environments, you want it to be very uh, solid and documented what you're doing, but 
uh, doing a video on how to use a HTTPS encapsulated OpenVPN uh, to get by maybe some government that is tyrannical and their filters and their deep packet inspection might be an interesting video. So that's something we are working on. So, and I do not, uh, I do not support uh, getting around the school <laughs> just because uh, you can doesn't mean you should. I mean, be be nice. The teachers, look, you kids are killing them over here, man. They're, you're you're not even you're they're they're not as savvy as you guys. It's I know we work with schools. The budget's about this big to do things. We know the kids have pwned most of it. <laughs> so that's yeah, that's definitely a, an issue. Um, but nonetheless, um, yeah. They also now here's the thing you're not going to go through if you have a certificate installed on that device. Uh, HTTPS encapsulation doesn't work. So if you have to have a certificate installed because they have a certificate at the edge uh, uh, of the network and you have to do an extra signed certificate on that computer, you're not going to get around the VPN system um, that they, they have because now they can see into your traffic. The way the HTTPS traffic works is it encapsulates a TLS HTTPS connection and then inside of that, wraps in there. And we've been doing some speed testing overseas with it. It's actually working quite well. So that's definitely uh, going to be kind of cool. The, well, I love doing in-depth stuff like this. These are some of the other things that I have not done a lot of videos on, but that we have taken the time, me and my friends have hung out and done tests and building of these networks uh, to make sure they work. And like I said, these are, these are my hobbies. This is why I don't play video games because this is the video game. How are we going to defeat this? And how are we going to uh, do this? So <laughs> Do I have a web recommendation for a school web filter? Uh, I'm not, I don't know where they're at with it, but I think there's a commercial, a larger scale product for the commercial version of DNS thingy with PFSense. Um, web filtering is really hard for schools and or anyone really, if you want to do it with DNS. Um, it's going to be tricky. It's it's just, it's, it's a losing battle because kids are really savvy at it. Uh, but there are products out there. There's also things like doing... Um, uh, Umbrella has a support for that. The uh, Open DNS they have a commercial product available, and they give a discount to school districts for it. So they, you know, they're one of the things. Uh, Untangle, yes, Untangle is another company. I've not used it, but I've talked to people that said they have a commercial package that they sell for web filtering. Uh, that is part of why you pay for Untangle, and that's actually here's the thing: Can you run a pie hole to block things? Can you do that? The sauce, the money is all in the rule sets. So we use solar winds. That's how we use our filtering is all with the solar winds product. We do all the web filtering for clients. It filters all the bad stuff. The reason we pay so much money to solar winds for this is the knock team, the security team that keeps these patches coming out and keeps, keeps these sites blocked and analyzing the traffic and constantly updating the rules to make sure these bad sites are. It's not even the software. Who cares? The software is easy. You could, you could modify lots of things to work. The feed is the money. And this is even with your intrusion detection systems. Yeah, here's our free open rules on the internet. Here's our real-time data analysis feed that we're going to sell you that we're doing by monitoring this because that is so somewhat automated, somewhat manual process, developing these feeds, making sure they're accurate, making sure they're good, and then pushing the data back out. So, yeah, so there's that. So if you, if you want to set up that filtering, you want that higher-level filtering, I mean, you can use Squid Guard and then add some more things into it and then install the SSL search. Uh, this, you know, it's funny. This is what my daughter does at school. She has to do research. The web filtering is so broken at her school that they can't even ever get the things the teacher asked them to research. It just breaks all day long and everyone turns their phone into a hotspot. She uses all the data on her phone because that's how she gets around the filtering. She doesn't connect to the school. That's like her solution. And everyone's solution is to turn your phone into a hotspot, connect the device so you can get some work done or just do the work at home. So it's kind of funny, like they have swung the other way because every kid has a phone now. Um, they just go around it. So I don't even know how relevant it is to spend too much time on that. Just block everything. Don't worry that it breaks everything. And the kids go around it anyways because you're using your own device. But by using your own device, you're not responsible for what they did. <laughs> so uh, where can I add domains block? Uh, oh, add your own. I think there, the way you would do it is you would create a series of lists under the uh, aliases to block the domains and then you create block rules for those maybe i'll do a video on that that might be fun of how to block domains 
Uh, yeah, we can have that text moan that it messes uh, with the map. Yeah, it's it max it does there. Yeah, it does break lots of things. I, I have that video, like I said earlier, for those of you that weren't here. Um, I have a video on why not to use Squid to filter the websites. Now it gets a step further because if you're not familiar with uh, PKI um, and certificate pinning. Um, that the browsers are now using because it's embedded as part of the HTTPS uh, where the site also verifies that the um, certificate has not been modified or spoofed. And this comes back to the TLS 1.3. You have a whole new level of breakage you're going to see with all these commercial firewalls uh, with TLS 1.3 because as we up the notch of security to make sure that the transport packets from my computer to the endpoint website are secure, if you've put these edge man in the middle boxes, you now have tampered with that security and you are breaking it. And therefore some of these websites will, you know, also break that. Uh, do you want to, do you ever do a video on MS direct access? What is MS direct access? I'm, I'm not familiar with it. What is it? <laughs> what is it? I don't know. Uh, direct like building RDP, like directly accessing the machines. We have a lot of clients that run RDP and things like that. So, oh, um, I have no one running the direct uh, Microsoft direct access, oddly enough. Is it? Yeah, yeah, okay. I know, I know what you're talking about. I've never used it. Uh, the reason we don't is so many of our clients that are running OpenVPN on our computers so they can run in, they don't just access uh, some of the Microsoft stuff. Uh, we actually have a, they, they generally just VPN into their office network and it just works. And we have open, uh, we have PFSense handling everything via OpenVPN. So it hasn't really, yeah, you're rolling it on, it's awful. Not surprising. Um, oh, I have so few problems with OpenVPN. I don't know why more people don't use it. People always ask me, I'm having trouble setting up IPsec and getting it to work properly. I'm like, really? There's a reason why I recommend OpenVPN. <laughs> so <laughs> it's just, yeah. Not to mention, I mean, like uh, Microsoft pushed for years their PPTP VPNs before Moxie Marlin Spike found the flaw uh, of that and they finally deprecated it was not a great vpn solution so yeah um i have no one using radius i have no people that are that said it works fine i am not using it uh but the people that are said it does work so it's uh, the radius server is supposed to work perfectly fine you're supposed to be good integration for it um, for the authentication. The same thing, I've been told it works really well with Unify. I don't have any deployments using Unify with a radius uh, that I can cite as an example that I have myself done, but I have been told it works quite well. Had it running on Clear OS. Um, also, if you look at my Twitter account, I tweeted uh, why you shouldn't run your own mail server, which I think is kind of funny. And I, it's a security researcher who talked about all the flaws in it. And it's one of those things that go back and forth. I thought about doing a video on mail servers because I do run one for my personal email addresses. Uh, but it is one of those things like it's not for the faint of heart. And how much email is sent today and how much like I've had problems with my mail server, especially getting outbound email is the bigger problem than deal. I've got solutions for some of the spam using post gray and filtering. And um, it's behind a PF sense with IDS. So it stops some of the other crap from coming in. And I've got country blocking to stop crap from coming in. But it's it's like so much maintenance. I do it as a hobby. Um, and if it breaks, I go, Oh, I'm listing some personal emails or something like where my Facebook's registered to it. So I, I don't care about the messages that come to it or so it's not anything I can fix it later type thing. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be late for the scooter thing. It's, it's at six 20. I just looked at it. I think that's when they want to meet up. I was looking at it down there. <laughs> um, uh, nope, no LTE modem. Um, haven't haven't had much of a use for an LTE modem. Uh, I I have in only the rarest of circumstances ever used even my phone as a hotspot. It does work as one. Never used it, but a couple times in years. Uh, everywhere I go has internet. Um, that's or if they don't have internet, that's why I'm there and I'm there to fix the internet. <laughs> so <laughs> that's generally yeah. A um, couple things coming up. Uh, the job is getting closer, so hopefully there'll be some follow-up videos because there's there's been some shenanigans at that big job that's being built out at that Family Fun Center. Um, hopefully we'll have a finalized wrap-up video on that. I do want to do a video. Hopefully next week we're going to be doing a uh, outdoor Wi-Fi setup. 
um, with all unified equipment. We just got the call that that got approved. They dropped the check in the mail. Why do they drop the check in the mail? I don't know. We have online payments and approvals for things and quotes with the Invoice Ninja. Give those guys a shout out. I got their shirt on. Um, so I, but they, they were writing a check. So as soon as they check here, I'll know the exact date. We plan to film um, how we did it. And it's going to be a top to, uh, well, it's going to be a top to bottom video too, because we're going to show like how we plan the Wi-Fi, how we put Wi-Fi in the harbor. So it's not just an outdoor Wi-Fi. It's a Wi-Fi for a harbor. Um, and because of the way it's set up, it's going to have a site to site, a new firewall, a site to site, and a series of outdoor Wi-Fi units for the boats. So all the people on the boats can um, have internets because that's important when you're on a boat. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Um, I have debated, and I don't know if there's a demand for me doing more uh, Invoice Ninja videos. Uh, we are we use it intensely. Matter of fact, uh, we got a compliment today. They don't. They kind of joke with me. They don't. They don't know if it's a compliment or not. Like you guys invoice really fast, and I'm like, yeah. She goes like less than 24 hours after you do anything, we already got the bill. I'm like, yeah, it's probably even the same day. And you just don't notice the email. She goes, yeah. Um, that is one of those things that. Um, you know, we definitely have been using invoice engines. We've integrated it a lot in there. We've worked with the developers. They've been great to keep adding and enhancing things and stuff like that. So, uh, browse, they're yachts. They're not fishing. They're hanging out. Uh, it's a yacht place more than a boat place. It's not fishermen, really. I mean, I imagine there's a few of them fishing. Uh, but it's, these are some yacht clubs uh, that these are going in because they, they have the money to install Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> is there any special reason this box is shiny that's why it's on the table this box was just on the table uh i don't remember why at all maybe i was loading a firmware update or doing a test or maybe one of my other staff was doing a test uh this is sometimes used as the staging room for things um before anything goes to a client it has been completely configured tested maybe even tested for a number of days before delivery to make sure there's no issues with it anytime there's an opportunity to test it um, it, it, we have not thrown away the box only because it's shiny. This one has a product in it. It actually still has an edge router in it. This is only here because it shines. We, we kind of want to flatten it out and stick it to the wall because if, even if we, we decided before we tested this, even if we didn't like the TP link, we wanted to keep the box. Like even if the product turned, whether the product was good or bad, the box was getting kept because it's so damn shiny that we loved it. <laughs> so there's that. All right, well, I'm actually going to get out of here uh, so I can go play with scooters and go probably drink beer and play with scooters with friends. Uh, the, I think they call themselves, it's a new group of people I met, so they call themselves, we have the Downriver Scooter Club because we're called Downriver here. This is the Michigan Scooter Geek Meetup, and uh, we're going to have beer and talk about scooters. So, because <laughs> that's what you do when you're in your 40s. This is my, this is my midlife crisis thing is going and playing with scooters, I guess. <laughs> All right. Have a wonderful time. See you guys on the channel. Uh, I'm looking over here to see that. Wow, that's neat. An hour and 22 minutes. I can't see that on here, but it's on the timer over there where we started the live stream. All right. Thanks. More videos coming. Bye.